is a special presentation of Fox Sports Net. The Diamondbacks were the favorites in the West, but the Giants have become the team to beat. Tonight could be the night as the Bay Area will be rocking and the Snakes will go home hungry. Bonds and Kent have been the franchise, but this team is fundamentally sound and doing it with hitting, pitching, and defense. It's time to celebrate. The Giants go for the National League West title next. Welcome now to Pac Bell Park in San Francisco, where tonight the Giants will try and clinch the National League West title. It's the Arizona Diamondbacks and the San Francisco Giants. The Giants have a dominant 11 game lead over the Dodgers and 11 and a half over the defending champion Arizona Diamondbacks. The magic number is one. If the Giants win tonight, the West is one. And hi, everybody. I'm Steve Fiziak, and welcome to our pregame show. Tonight, we will chronicle the unusual success of San Francisco the last two and a half months of the season. We will also have bonus coverage of games' importance around Major League Baseball. And join me tonight, Kevin Kennedy. And, Kevin, we've got to talk about this terrific success by San Francisco. The last two and a half months, they've been incredible. But as you've said so many times, it starts at the top with Dusty Baker. No doubt about it. Dusty Baker's a two-time manager of the year. And people say he's a player's manager. Well, that doesn't mean he he doesn't have team discipline and he doesn't have team rules. He does. But what a player's manager is, is a man who communicates, who has passion, who has fun with the game, likes to get to know his players both on and off the field. Dusty Baker does that, and consequently, his players respond and they all play well together. And he's probably going to win that manager of the year award again this year. And Dusty says, It's not about me, it's the guys in the field. And since July 1, those guys in the field have just played incredible baseball. They really have. They've been, a, they were a 500 team on July the 1st. Since that time, they are. 30 games over 500, dominant in Major League Baseball. The reason is all categories, pitching, fielding, and hitting. They're near the top in all those categories. And we know all about Barry Bonds and Jeff Kent. Both of those guys are definitely MVP candidates. But guys like Rich Aurelia have done a great job defensively and offensively at shortstop. Bill Miller leading the National League in fielding. J.T. Snow. Russ Ortiz has had a phenomenal second half. The pitching's been outstanding. And even Kurt Reeder pitching tonight. This guy wins in double figures the last four years. He's been great also and we really thought we might be celebrating maybe two and a half months ago thought Arizona might be wrapping up the Western title but Arizona has not played that well and what are their chances in the wild card the rest of the way well they, they come into this ball game six games back of the wild card they just got swept by the Dodgers they have a slim slim chance I think the Mets are going to win that even though the Mets have not been playing well in the month of September but neither have the D-backs they're not scoring runs and the biggest difference this year between this year and last year is a lack of home run production from two right handed hitters Jay Bell and Matt Williams combined they only have 23 home runs a year ago they had 73 home runs that's a lack of run production right there from the big right handed bats and those two guys protect the lefties like Luis Gonzalez and Steve Finley and they're 10th in the league in hitting I think that's the biggest biggest reason the D-backs have been down this year and right now San Francisco in the driver's seat we'll come back talk more about the Giants and the Arizona Diamondbacks on Baseball Thursday on Fox Sports Net from Pac Bell Park in San Francisco Francisco. Baseball Thursday on Fox Sports Net is brought to you by McDonald's. We love to see you smile. By Toyota. Toyota making it happen every day. And by Fram, who asked, when was the last time you changed your air filter? We welcome you back to Pac Bell Park in San Francisco, a big part of the Giants' success in the year 2000. After losing their first six games here, the Giants have gone 53 and 17 by far, the best home record in baseball. The defending West champion Diamondbacks are 21 wins under their 100 win season from a year ago. Part of the problem is this starting lineup that has been well buried down offensively. Danny Bautista will lead things off play center field. Jay Bell hits second. Luis Gonzalez in the three position. Then Greg Colbrun, who is the first baseman, against Kirk Reeder. Look at that. Over 500 batting. Alex Cabrera bats fifth. Then Matt Williams, the third baseman, down this year, only 29 RBIs. Damian Miller hits seventh. Danny Clausen will be the shortstop hitting eighth. 
And on the mound, Todd Stottlemyre. Kirk Reeder is the pitcher you will see for San Francisco this year, 10 and 9, a 404 earned run average. He has allowed 22 home runs this year, but his strength control, 62 walks. And the first pitch he throws to Danny Batista is strike one. Yeah, Steve, he usually gives you a six plus innings per start. This is his 30th start of the year. Get that little sinking fast, but likes to paint the outside corner. Veteran pitcher now goes 6 2 and weighs about 205 pounds. He's from tiny Hoylton, Illinois, a population of only 500, but he really has flown through not only the professional baseball system with Montreal, now with San Francisco, but he has been a winner. And it's 1 and 2 now to Danny Batista. Well, you're right. He's, believe it or not, since 1980, he's the third winningest left hander in Major League Baseball behind Randy Johnson and Andy Pettit. There's a looping line drive right to Jeff Kent. Let's check out that San Francisco defense. They're second in the National League to Colorado with only 85 errors this year. There's a gold glove at first base who is outstanding, and J.T. Snow. Second base, Jeff Kent. Third base, Bill Miller, only nine errors there. Shortstop, Rich Aurelia. A gold glove in left. And Barry Bonds. Jay Bell comes to the plate. Marvin Bernard is the center fielder. Right field, Ellis Burks, the Willie McCovey Award winner this year. And behind the plate, Doug Mirabelli. And Mirabelli catches that low fastball from Kirk Reeder. One ball and one strike. There is Doug. They share the catching responsibilities here in San Francisco with Doug and also, Bobby Estelea. Two and one. So, mentioning that winning percentage for Kurt Reeder, he's 80 and 48 lifetime. That's why he's third best of lefties. Winning percentage since 1980. You know, he broke into the major leagues, which is brilliant success going 10 and 0. Major league record for wins to start a career is 12 straight, held by Hooks Wiltsey. A New York Giant way back in 1904, which was really the Giants' best season ever. Ball flip foul. Reader last season had a solid season, winning 15 games, even though the earned run average was at five and a half. Right, he was 15 and 10 in 99, and two years ago he was 16 and 9. With the ZRA at 4-3. He's pretty consistent. He's not a power pitcher, as we've said. He spots the fastball on both sides of the plate. Rarely will hit 90, usually about 85 to 88. Drops in a curve, mixes in the changeup, and has a cutter. Jay Bell got on on that one. Just 85 miles an hour, and he says his four seam fastball tops out max at 87. Yeah, Two that, seam about 84, but it's his command, his location. That's about it. I mean, that's where you're going to see his range 85 to 88, but he spots the outside corner mostly on righties. Jay Bell rips one to left right there. Barry Bonds, he'll pull it down for the second out. Well, when it says average major league fastball, an average major league fastball as far as velocity is from 85 to 86, 87 miles an hour. That's it. Above average would be obviously 88 to 90, and well above average, the mid 90s. The changeup, any time, any count, gets a lot of ground ball outs and very, very good at holding runners at first base. So, Reader now will face the left hander, Luis Gonzalez, whose number is about the same as last year. Luis, right where you would expect, he goes up the first pitch. Pops it up, center field. On comes Marvin Bernard and the sellout crowd here at Pac Bell Park. They are celebrating a shutout first inning. They're hoping they're closer to winning the West. Another crowd of better than 40,000 on hand at Pac Bell Park in San Francisco. Game one of the series between the Diamondbacks and the Giants. Here is Dusty Baker's starting lineup. He will lead things off with Marvin Bernard hitting second, Bill Miller, then Barry Bonds at the age of 36, a career high, 48 home runs. Jeff Kent cleans things up, then J.T. Snow, Ellis Burks, Rich Aurelia, Doug Mirabelli, and Kirk Reeder. And how's your scouting report on Todd Stoudemire? Well, this is his fourth start back since coming back off the disabled list for a couple of months from elbow problems. 
really didn't think Todd would even come back twice this season he's been on the DL last year it was shoulder problems rotator tear this year elbow problems but this guy's a battler he's a scrapper and Pat Stottlemyre will see if his velocity he had some problems in his last start against Atlanta only went three innings before he got knocked out he does have one victory since his comeback he went seven and a third innings against Florida in the previous start before the Atlanta Braves so we'll see how he fares tonight overall he's nine and six ERA is pushing five still one of the most competitive pitchers when you look at his history particularly his history the last two years with injuries he is a fighter a battler and he will do the same with San Francisco. Well that's what's surprising that he even came back this year this guy did not want to have surgery rehab strengthen the muscles around the shoulder a year ago same thing with the elbow and he's come back but maybe too little too late for the Arizona Diamondbacks they just have not played well in the second half. And really it has not been pitching it has been offense as you talked about earlier. Here is Marvin Bernard hitting 271. Stottlemyre throws low ball one. Well, you're right this ball club is still fifth in the National League as far as overall team ERA. And even with the addition of Kurt Schilling though that wasn't enough to keep the Diamondbacks in first place. And it's tough when a Giants team is playing over 700 ball for 90 days. That's tough to beat. <laughs> they just they've just been phenomenal. But the Diamondbacks did have a chance to wild card and actually still do. So this becomes an important game because the Mets are just not playing well in the month of September. Marvin Bernard rips one, but right at the right fielder, and Alex Cabrera will take care of it for the first out. Defensively for the Arizona Diamondbacks, because of so many injuries, they've never been the same. First base, Greg Colbrin. Second base, Jay Bell. He's been there most of the season. Matt Williams, who's been plagued by foot problems this year at third. Danny Clawson, the new shortstop. Luis Gonzalez in left field. Center field, Danny Bautista. First pitch swinging is Bill Miller, and he lost it to left field, and Gonzalez will take care of it. That is the second out, the bottom of the first inning. Alex Cabrera, really a first baseman, shifted to right field just to get his back in the lineup. And catching Damian Miller shares that responsibility with Kelly Stanett. Well, the Diamondbacks have had some key injuries, no doubt about it. Durazo, their first baseman, that was so good when he came up last year. He's had problems with the wrist. He's out for the rest of the year. But the main problem, as you said, Steve, has really been their hitting. They're tenth in the league in hitting, and they just haven't had the run production, particularly from Jay Bell and the injured Matt Williams, like they had a year ago. Now Stoudemire against Barry Bonds, and he comes inside twice now against Barry, two and zero. Oh. Bonds tied Lou Gehrig with 493 home runs. Hit it last night, a splashdown home run into the bay. The Giants have had six splash home runs this year and Bonds has all of them. He sends that one down the line foul. When you take a look at guys all time here is a guy who will be headed to Cooperstown in the Hall of Fame 493 tying Gehrig and Eddie Murray right in front of him, just 11 away. This Shoots for 500. No doubt about that he's going to join Willie McCovey. In the Hall of Fame, the pregame ceremony with Willie McCovey. And McCovey Cove, named after Willie McCovey, obviously, and that's where Barry Bonds would like to put one right now. Now that one misses outside ball four, so Bonds is on. San Francisco with a two out walk, but really it only gets even more difficult for Todd because he faces a guy with more RBIs now, and Jeff Kent, what a 3 4 combination in Bonds and Kent. Well, that's one of the reasons for Bonds. He now has 113 walks. And you put Barry Bonds on, and you got Jeff Kent to deal with. And man, his third in run production this year 124 runs driven in. Great 3 4 combination for the San Francisco Giants. But it's more than just these two guys. It's, it's the guys around them. It's the setup, man. It's JT Snow with 93 runs driven in also. Jeff Kent to right field and deep and it is off the wall. Bonds.
Adams comes around. He will score. San Francisco takes a 1-0 lead. Well, that's the problem pitching around Barry Bonds. You put him on. It can't drive you in, but that ball should have been caught. It was played very poorly out there. Cabrera, really a first baseman, getting that right-handed bat in there against Kirk Reeder. That's why he's playing out there in right field. Take a look. The ball was hit well, but it should have been caught. There's no doubt about it. He just misplayed it. Take a look. Doesn't exactly know where he's at. Doesn't realize. Now he realizes he's close to the wall, yeah, but he just misjudged the ball. That's got to be caught. It'll go as a double and a run driven in, but. Cabrera knows he should have made that play. And so does Buck Showalter. Right field defense has been a problem spot for Buck Showalter this year. Travis Lee, who was a first baseman, played there and is a good athlete and played well at times. Really, they need to find a guy who can play every day out in right field and give them some power. Well, normally, Finley's out in center and Batista's in right, but they give Finley a day off. With the lefty Kurt Reeder on the mound for the Giants. So Cabrera gets out there and the ball seems to find you. Yes, no doubt about does. that. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's JT Snow. He is from the left side always now. He used to be a switch hitter. And he takes outside ball three. Snow drove in three runs last night as San Francisco beat Cincinnati four to two. It clinched at least a tie for the Western title, but they want to celebrate. Dusty Baker wants it tonight. There's a strike three and one. Well, he wants it tonight, but also you have to continue and push hard because you've got to get that home field advantage. So you still want to have the best record in the National League. Swing and a miss, three and two. And JT Snow was talking about that before the ball game, saying it doesn't end if we clinch it here. No, I have to take that. Attitude and that grinded out mentality straight to the playoffs. And the other thing about clinching fairly early with about nine, ten days to go, and we did this back in Boston in uh, '95, we clinched September 20th. But you have to keep the intensity up like you've had all season long. And so do you know when the last time that San Francisco clinched this early? 1954, when they left oh. won the World Series. Four well, games to nothing I over Cleveland. I think if you ask any manager, would you rather go into the final weekend before you know if you're in the playoffs or clinching early, you'd say, hey, let's clinch early, give some key guys a little bit of rest, get your rotation set for the playoffs so you have your one, two, and three starters in order, and then you take your chances from there. Well, San Francisco with a two out rally, a two out walk to Bonds, then Jeff Kent doubles, drives in his 125th. Now a walk to J.T. Snow, and here is Ellis Burks, who has been one of the real favorites in San Francisco this year. Just his toughness, his true grit. I mean, he is playing on two knees, Kevin, that hardly have any cartilage in them at all. It's bone on bone, painful, but he wants out there. That's right. At 360 hitter, most of the year he's 0 for his last 10. He's down to 346, but he does play hard. One thing about Ellis Burks, hits the ball in the air, a routine pop-up. He'll run hard all the way down the line. Ground ball, he'll run hard all the way. He's not one of those guys to Cadillac, and that's why the fans appreciated him tonight. And he heard the big ovation when he came up the home plate. Jeff Kent second. JT Snow first. Time called by Ellis Burks. This is still the fans' game. The fans don't like dogs. They like dogs in this park, they like dogs in the bay. But they don't like dogs as players. And they like guys that hustle and play hard, and they recognize that. And I was talking to some people last night just out and about in the city, and they were talking about Ellis Burks and the hustle that he puts on, and they appreciate that. They feel he is a dog, but a dirt dog. <laughs> a good and dog. That's why the music, Who Let the Dogs Out, Woof Woof, Ellis Burks <laughs> is one of those dogs they let out. You've got that tune down now, haven't you? <laughs> They've been playing it for a half hour before the game. <laughs> And Alex and his son, who is also in the dugout, they were dancing. Yeah, I know next week you're going to be singing that. Oh, no. There is a good off speed pitch thrown by Todd Stottlemyre, but he gives up a run. Jeff Kent with his 125th run driven in. But here in San Francisco, it's Bonds. And Bonds with six splash hits this year. Check it out. The Giants have been hot. They have won 17 of their last 21, 27 of their last 36. 
fifty three of their last seventy five they want the best record in baseball right now one victory more than the Atlanta Braves two up in that loss column. San Francisco knows their success here at Pac Bell Park where they have the best home record in baseball 53 and 23. Know the crowd will be roaring for them in the postseason. And now Kirk Reeder will face the Diamondbacks cleanup hitter Greg Colburn. We showed you Greg's numbers against Kirk Reeder. This time Reeder figures it out by throwing in that changeup at 73 miles an hour. It's one and two but. Colburn 14 for 27 <laughs> against the Giants lefty. Well they played together also in Montreal they came up in the system together they know each other. Colburn's always been a good hitter. He had a, a couple of really strong years in Florida when he was starting. And then the last few years he's been the right handed pinch hit specialist. And now gets a chance to start because of the injuries at first base and the trading of Travis Lee. And he's done a great job. Yes. Arizona does not re-sign Kurt Schilling. You wonder if that trade will come back to haunt them if Travis Lee ever develops into the outstanding hitter we saw in college at San Diego State. Well, Again, off speed three and two. Somebody's got to get to Travis Lee. Uh, one of the reasons they traded him, they, I heard that he was uncoachable here. But they tried to get him to use his legs better because Travis does not use the lower half of his body, and that's why. He's had a lack of production in the big leagues. Ground ball short, bobbled by Aurelia, picks it up in time. And JT with that fine stretch, there's the first out. The Giants have a 1 0 lead because of a defensive mistake by Arizona in the bottom of the first inning. Alex Cabrera's coming to the plate, who's trying to trace this one by Jeff Kent. Yeah. Probably the first time I believe it is the first time he's been in Pac Bell ballpark because he was in the minor leagues earlier when the Diamondbacks were here and he just did not realize where he was how close he was to the wall out there. There's a lot of angles out there. This is one of those ballparks you've got to come out early in the afternoon and have one of the coaches take you and hit some balls off the wall and and make sure you know all the angles and all the little tricks out there and he just didn't know where he was. And that ball should have been caught. So now Cabrera who has plenty of power. Homered in his first major league at back back in June. Rare 28 years old from Venezuela always showed good power in the minor leagues now getting an opportunity in the bigs. But it has been Kevin five months since the Giants in Arizona met. Well and that's the thing they, they play eight of the last 11 games this year against each other. And about six weeks ago, you thought those games were going to be really important for not only division but the wild card. And now it's only important for the Diamondbacks, really, for the wild card. But their lack of hitting, they got shut out the last two nights by the Dodgers. Good Dodger pitching. And the D backs had good pitching as well, but they just couldn't hit with men in scoring position. Good pitch by a reader. Slips that fastball on the outside corner. Count is full three and two. We've seen Kirk already with a lot of three ball counts, but he will tease you. Well, the thing about him, we talked about that change. If he'll throw that at any time, any count like this one right here. And it is popped up right side. J.T. Snow covers pop ups better than any first baseman. He will give way to Jeff Kent, who will make the catch. And Jeff juggles it for a moment. Now he'll smile as he collects the second out. Well, there is a breeze blowing from right to left, and you've got to check that. The Giants know that. Saturday it's this week in baseball this week's host is White Sox second baseman Ray Durham who talks about his team's resurgent and their postseason hopes catch this week in baseball Saturdays on Fox at 1230 Eastern and Pacific or you can catch it right here on Fox Sports Net Mondays at 530 check local listings it's as close to the game as you can get here is Matt Williams fouls it off you have a 15 to 20 mile an hour wind that goes Right foul pole to left foul pole. That's exactly why JT Snow gave way to Kent and Jeff Kent, even though he had the angle at first, the ball just drifted at the end there and reminds him of a old candlestick part. But that's exactly why you use two hands always in San Francisco. You've got that right. If he didn't have that other hand up there, it would have been, a, would have been too late. He would have dropped it. 
But here's a former Giant, Matt Williams, had great success with the Giants, helped them to play us in the late 80s, early 90s. He was part of their last team that went to the World Series in 1989, where they lost to the Crosstown Oakland A's. But last year, 35 home runs and 142 driven in. Well, we talked about that at the open. What's really happened to the Diamondbacks? I think two key guys, just Jay Bell's run production is down, and Matt Williams was hurt. And when, since he's come back, he has not been the same guy. Popped up right side, Ellis Burks and Kirk Reeder. Two perfect innings. We head to the bottom of the second inning. Rich Aurelia, Doug Mirabelli, and Reeder are coming up. Go Barry and that old Christmas Carol let it snow let it snow let it JT snow the Giants with a one nothing lead that's look at left field with a big glove beyond left we're at Pac Bell Park where San Francisco trying to clinch and Buck Showalter trying to pull his offense back to life what, look what has happened I mean they've almost scored 200 runs less than what they did last year yeah the batting average isn't that far off 13 points but the run production itself the home run production the power numbers are dramatically down this year for the reasons we mentioned Matt Williams injury and Jay Bell just hasn't been getting uh, the pitches he did a year ago to hit when you lose the big number four hitter Matt Williams in that lineup it really changes the whole complexion of the middle of your order. Rich Aurelia goes after the first pitch knocks into Matt Williams one out. One of the reasons I was, I was really enthralled with the D backs design last year is because they had Jay Bell hitting second Luis Gonzalez third and they had Matt Williams and they had Steve Finley or they could mix that up they had right left right left and all those guys had 30 plus home run power and they were all protecting each other and when you got one key right handed bat like Matt Williams out the first couple of months then all of a sudden you got Finley doubling up behind Luis Gonzalez three four you got two lefties in a row and it, it really changes the heart of your order and it's easier to pitch too late in the game when you bring in the relievers. Now Stottlemyre faces Doug Mirabelli. You bring that lefty specialist in you can face Gonzalez and Finley back to back a year ago you couldn't do that you bring the lefty in to face Gonzalez then you got to bring the righty in to face Matt Williams and you blow up your bullpen this year that hasn't happened against the Diamondbacks. And really the team earned run average at four point three is fifth lowest right. in the National League you can't blame that area defensively they've been OK it has strictly been offense. Mirabelli takes high. Two balls and no strikes. We talked a little bit about Kurt Schilling when they made that trade. He thought, well, Schilling to go with Randy Johnson, forget about it. That one two punch was going to match Maddox and Glavin in Atlanta. And these guys are not only going to go to the playoffs, they're going to blow through the playoffs. Well, it doesn't always work out that way. Schilling, only four and six records since he's come to the Diamondbacks. He's thrown well, but <laughs> look at the numbers. There it is. Four and six. And Randy Johnson has had a tough time in the second half. Not so much Randy's fault, it's just that they haven't scored for him. At this time, we want to welcome our viewers from MSC Wisconsin, where the Milwaukee Brewers have defeated the Pittsburgh Pirates by a score of 12 to 2. I'm Steve Fiziak, along with Kevin Kennedy here at Pac Bell Park in San Francisco. The Giants trying to clinch the National League West with a victory. Tonight they will do that. They lead Arizona 1-0. The base hit by Doug Mirabelli with one out. And San Francisco with a rally for Dusty Baker. Well, this is an obvious bunt situation, and one thing the Giants have done well this year is execute bunts. Particularly their pitchers. They usually get it down. You try to make the first base and field it. Reader does, and it's a perfect bunt. Going to second base, Mirabelli. And the reason you make the first base and field it. Obviously because Matt Williams is about 20 feet away from you by the time the ball's crossing home plate. Why does that happen Kevin is it because this team works on that part of their game more than others. Yeah they do it's emphasized in spring training but the thing about this ball club is that you have to do it not only in spring training you do it early and they do a lot of early work. I saw them out here today as a matter of fact the pitchers are out here hitting before anybody and working on those things and and doing it seriously too by the way not just playing home run derby it's fun for the pitchers they like to hit and they like to have a little home run derby but get the serious stuff done get the bunts down do the things that are going to happen most often during the ball game, and then let a few swings go also because I would imagine the bunts outweigh the home runs by pitchers 
99 to 1. <laughs> At least. <laughs> so Dusty says get him down because that might be the run you need, Kirk, later in the ball game. And it's claim a victory. Where to get him down. It's not only just getting the technique down, it's understanding when to bunt the first base, when to make the third base and field it, knowing the situation. You got a runner at second base when you're bunting, different situation. Then you make the third base and field it most of the time. If you can. It's not just getting a bunt down and hoping and praying. Marvin Bernard base hit right field. They will send Mirabelli. Here's the throw to the plate. Not in time. They have Bernard trapped in a rundown, but he did that as he drives in the run. And San Francisco takes a 2 0 lead over Arizona. Get him on, get him over, get him in. It's the San Francisco story in the new millennium. Well, one word says the Giants' season this year, and it's called execution. And once again, they do it. They get the bunt down by Kirk Reeder. Marvin Bernard executes the base hit. They put another run on the board. Reeder making the first baseman field the bunt if he can. At least it's first base way. Stottlemyre picks it up. Great sacrifice bunt by Reeder. Now, Marvin Bernard got a big hole here. He's going to go right through the hole here on the right side. Marvin Bernard gets the ball middle in, turns on it, and drills it through the right side. And Cabrera comes up throwing, but Colburn's going to cut this off to make sure because you got a slow running catcher in Millibelli. So that's a good move by Marvin Bernard to make sure the run scores with two outs there by actually getting picked off. He went towards second base intentionally, wanting them to cut that ball off. That's a design play and a very good one. Well, Kirk Reeder, you have the 2 0 lead. Here's a guy in the month of September. His career record is 18 and 6. Reader just gets better as the season progresses. As a matter of fact, last two months of the season in his career, he is 32 and 13 in August and September. So Reader feeling comfortable. And he gets that fastball on the outside corner. Bill Miller, only nine errors this year, throws another out. And Damian Miller is thrown out by Bill Miller. Look at the second half. I mean, their earned run average is right at three since that July 1st start where they turned it around, went from six and a half back of Arizona to now an 11 and a half game lead. And good balance in the rotation because you got Estes and Reeder there at the bottom. They are left handed Ortiz, Hernandez, Gardner's, or righty, righties. And that's good balance in your starting rotation to have three right handers and two lefties. Joe Nathan was in the rotation early, but he went out with tendonitis. Now he's back. He's in the bullpen because Mark Gardner. Has done such a great job. So they've got a young starter there in Joe Nathan that eventually will crack that rotation again. This guy throws 94, 95 miles an hour. They just got depth in the starting rotation now in the bullpen. And when they get late into the ball game, you get to the eighth inning, you got Felix Rodriguez throwing 98 and Robbie Nen coming in throwing 99. And that's tough at the end of a ball game. Robbie Nen hasn't blown a save since June. And I remember Johnny O's with his 96 team. He said, "We get 70 wins out of our starting pitchers. We will win the American League West easily." They got 70 wins that year. If you include Joe Nathan, San Francisco has 70 wins from their starting pitchers yeah, this year. Yeah, they've got six guys that can start, and that's why Gardner was so valuable to him. Mark, a veteran starting pitcher, at one time a couple of years ago was actually the ace of this staff, and he's a swing man. He can start. He can be your long man, middle man. Spot starter, start at double headers, rain, you get rained out. He's a guy who can pick you up. So he's a real valuable guy to have six guys. Kevin, watch start. this. Danny Clausen is at the plate, and Doug Mirabelli says it did not hit his foot. Let's see if it does. May have hit his toe. Mirabelli saying it hit the dirt in front of it. Danny didn't move, he just stood there. Well, you know how tough it is on a replay. That's how it is for an umpire. That might have hit him on the toe. Miller, Miller barely saying no, but it's going to stand as it is. Right, let's, you know what? That might have hit the dirt. <laughs> but you know what? You'll take a base any way you can. That was so close. That's how tough it is for the umpire. Not not close enough where he could overrule it. I mean, not obvious enough. Now Todd Stottlemyre showing bunt, and he takes strike one. All right. If the season postseason were to start today, who would your first three starters be for San Francisco? On this ball club, well, you've got to go with LeVon Hernandez, no doubt about it, the way he's been throwing. I really like Sean Estes, the lefty, because he's got that 90 plus fastball, that overhand curve, and a great changeup. Now the tough call. 
Well, I'll tell you what, you know, you mentioned a guy like Kirk Reeder, who. And Russ Ortiz has been the hottest pitcher and since he has. August That's 1st. right. And so you've got to decide who you're playing, whether you want another lefty, whether it's a, you know, you're facing a, a team like the Atlanta Braves, whether. And, you, and that's when you start looking at matchups and say, okay, one of these guys is going to pitch third, the other guy's going to be the fourth pitcher. You know, your fifth starter goes to the bullpen. But in a short series, in a five game divisional, you know, you might go with three starters. But you're right, Russ Ortiz has been so hot. But then you've got Kurt Reeder. He's won 10 games or more each of the last four years. The last giant pitcher to do that was John Burkett, 1990 to 93. And you've got the, one of the winningest lefties in Major League Baseball since 1980. Good options to have. The thing with Ortiz is, is if Reeder fails and you've got a strong guy like Russ Ortiz who could come out of the bullpen because he's been there before too this year. Got a guy throwing 95 coming out of there if, if Reeder let's say is your third starter and he and he fails early in the ballgame. Whereas you might you might rather have that than having Reeder come out of the bullpen. Stoudemire gets it down. Reeder's going to second and they get the force there. Now the ball dropped. I thought it was on the exchange. Yeah, I did too. I did too. I thought he was transferring to try to turn two. And this is Mike Winters at second base. He's now a veteran umpire. Mike Winters was a Triple A umpire for many years. Actually, years that I was in Albuquerque, and he's been in the big leagues a long time now. So he's not a a young umpire anymore. Dusty Baker arguing. I have to agree. I think with Dusty in this situation. Kevin, can you ask for help in this situation? No, that's really a judgment call. He's on top of it. That's an umpire judgment call. It's not like you're going into the ball across the back, fair or foul, or go inside or outside the foul pole. That's stolen bases, plays like this, forced plays at second base. These are judgment calls. Bunted to the wrong man, first of all. Now, Rich makes the stretch and attack. And he one hands the ball, and as he brings the glove back, let's watch. And he one hands it there. He's got it. Now he transfers. Oh, he's out. Yeah, that's a bad call. He's out. No doubt about it. Now, if he had two hands up there and did it immediately and dropped it, that's a different story. But clearly, you see Rich Aurelia spearing the ball with one hand and then transferring, bringing the glove down to his bare hand for the transfer, and that's when he dropped the ball. Not a good call. This time we want to welcome our viewers from MSC. The Minnesota Twins and Chicago White Sox were playing. I'm Steve Fiziak along with Kevin Kennedy here at Pac Bell Park in San Francisco. The White Sox beat the Twins 9 to 4. Stottlemyre save at first base, save at second base. Danny Clausen tying runs on as Danny Batista. Now come to the plate, a guy with good power, 10 home runs this year. And he's done a good job since he's come over to Arizona. He's been a 300 hitter for Buck Showalter. Now that bunt, first of all, you notice the difference between Reader's bunt, where I said he want to make the first baseman field the ball. That's what Reader did. That's why they executed. Stottlemyre bunted it right back to Reader. He did not make the first baseman field the ball, and because Reader fields left-handed as left-handed thrower, he had an easy throw to second base, and he he just didn't get the call. And then a shot to the gap, and that will roll the wall, and it will get both runs home. And now the call by the umpire is really causing concern by Reader. A 2 2 ball game on Danny Batista's triple. Yeah. yeah, that's a definite break for the Diamondbacks, something they haven't had a whole lot of lately. There's no doubt about it. Rich, you're right. You made the play. Mike, I'm sorry, my friend, you missed it. And then Danny Batista hits a low pitch right there and it shoots it into the gap. And this thing is going to bounce up against the triangle there at the 404 sign. The Karen being played by Bernard. He knows this ballpark well. The relay was good. But by the time they got it in, you've got a two run triple. Run snaps a streak of 21 consecutive scoreless innings by Arizona, which was a club record. Now Jay Bell comes to the plate. Now here's the bunt. Now you got to make the first baseman feel it, okay? But he does it. He bunts it toward Reader. Watch Reader. He, he knows he can get him at second base in plenty of time. Nice stretch by Rich Aurelia. And then when he goes to transfer, that's when he dropped the ball. And Mike Winters was right there. He just didn't see it that way. The second base umpire. He said, "No. From my vantage point, it looked like you just dropped the ball. You never had control of it." 
I believe he did. Half control. J. Bell fly it out first time up. Now fly ball will get Batista home with the go ahead run. I'll tell you one thing, Steve. If if the Diamondbacks were about two games out, it's a you, huge call. It's a huge call. I mean, it's not going to affect the outcome of the National League West, but by a slim chance, it could affect the outcome of the wild card. Because if the Diamondbacks win, they pick up a game on the New York Mets and get back to five, tied with the Dodgers. The Mets have been struggling. They were down 5 1 to Philadelphia, he came back to catch the Phillies, but then the Phillies, game winning sacrifice fly in the bottom of the ninth inning. Pitch just does. Catch a piece of the bat. Yeah, Jay Bell went to check his swing. I think it just nicked the bat. Would have been ball four. That was a situation last year where it was an automatic run batted in for Jay Bell. This year, only 62 RBIs. Infield back, one out. I mean, a ground ball anywhere but third will do it. Reaches out and punches that one to right field. Arizona has already scored more runs in this game in this inning than they did in the entire series against the Los Angeles Dodgers. Well, they have they've had a really tough time. Doing anything in Los Angeles. I mean Jay's battling right here but he's having a tough time in this at bat. One run a 242 team average. 25 men left on base and right here. That's that's the thing. 23 of 24 hits were singles. And last year this was a power hitting club. Well way out in front hooks it foul. It'll stay three and two. And the Giants with the defense back they will give up the go ahead run. Just the start of the third inning. Again, Bell fouls it out of play. It's Kirk Reader with that changeup again. He can throw it at any count, or he likes to cut the fastball in on it. He's got three pitches he could throw, actually four. He can he'll throw his curveball, he'll throw the cutter, the two seamer away, or the changeup on this count. Any one of those four pitches, cutter. In the air, left center. This should get Batista home. Bernard makes the catch. Here comes Danny. The throw by Bernard is not in time. And Arizona takes a 3 2 lead. And listen to the Boo Burrs in San Francisco. It's about the call by Mike Winters, the second base umpire. Well, tomorrow, the world's best drivers in the world's most legendary racetrack collide as the U.S. Grand Prix. Gets underway at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Catch both practice sessions, the qualifying and the race itself only on Fox Sports Net. Coverage begins at 12 tomorrow. Now Luis Gonzalez in what should have been the last out of the inning. And San Francisco with a 2-1 lead instead has a 3-2 Arizona advantage. And Gonzalez will fly to center field his first time up. Jolts one to right center. Burks will run it down, and that is the final out. But Arizona with three takes the lead on San Francisco. Miller, Bonds, Kent, when we come back. There's a view from the cruise ship Monte Carlo out beyond Pac Bell Park and McCovey Cove. Sold out Pac Bell Park, and you see standing room only there in right field. That's a loud engine. It sure is. <laughs> Where were they going? Get a better view? Uh, they're going to get some outstanding uh, dining in Marin County. You know what's a good place is that is 24 right downstairs. Willie Mays has a restaurant after him. That's it's pretty good. Here's Greg Colburn. Yeah, Willie Mays is on the ballpark. <laughs> I mean he has a statue right outside the stadium. He's got a beautiful restaurant here at the ballpark. Ball lifted in the air, right center field. Jeff Kent goes out and he will make the catch for the first out. 
Time for another Fox Sports Net Baseball Thursday game break. To Toronto we go where David Wells tries for his 20th win of the season. We go to the bottom of the sixth. Blue Jays leading 1 0. Carlos Delgado sends this pitch to deep right for his 41st home run of the season. That puts the Jays up 2 0. Now to the top of the ninth, two outs. David Wells strikes out Glenn Allen Hill to end the game. Wells is the first pitcher this year to collect 20 wins. Blue Jays win it 3 1. And the Yankees now struggling. They've lost eight of their last 11 games. And the Jays are closing ground four and a half back. It's amazing with about nine or ten games to go that the Blue Jays are that close because everybody thought the Yankees had that division wrapped up, but uh, they better finish it off. Get high and deep towards right field, and it is gone. I thought that ball would twist and go foul, but it is a long home run for Greg Colbrun. And did that go in the water? Alex Cabrera with the home run for Arizona. I tell you, he got down the right field line about 309, and that's why that ball got out. And Cabrera makes up for that run that he gave up in the in the first inning where he misplayed a fly ball that should have been caught went an RBI double he makes up for it by going deep take a look good shot right here down the right field line this thing hooking or slicing I should say but out of the ballpark and it's like I said it's 309 right down the right field line so he hit it in the right spot but he has a lot of power he can hit him out anywhere. A smash past Jeff Kent into right center field and Matt Williams as his first hit of the ball game. So Reader has given up a home run to Alex Cabrera. Now a single to Matt Williams gave up three in that third inning, even though he should have only given up one a mistake by second base right. our Mech winners. Yeah, he was sailing along. He tried the first seven batters of the ball game and and has had trouble now the last inning and a third. Right there, contact point going the other way toward right field for Matt Williams. And that's something he did not do in Dodger Stadium. I watched all three of those games and he was really pulling off the outside pitch. And they were just staying away, 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 and, and he was just pulling off the ball, striking out, missing a lot of balls. This time he gets one away and goes with it. Now Damian Miller with one out, run in, Cabrera's home run. Check swing, but he fouled it off. Strike two now to Damian. Of course, with Kirk Reeder, you have to look away. He's not going to live inside on you. He's going to live on the outside corner with that 85 fastball. So if you're going to sit there your whole at bat and look for one pitch in, you're not going to get it very often. He's, he's going to pitch a little bit like Tommy Glavin, paint away and then pitch in when he needs to, just to keep you honest. Well, he strikes him out. First strikeout by Kirk Reeder in the ball game. And here's our 7-11 baseball trivia question. Who are the only two players in the majors to hit 20 plus home runs in every season during the 1990s? Hmm. I think I've got one. I wonder if both of them are in the ballpark. It's a good be. Yeah. <laughs> There's Danny Classen. Lawson from Ontario, Canada, just 24, but they feel like he might be their shortstop of the future. Offensively, he may already be there. I'm still on the trivia. Could okay. they have been teammates at one time? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, you're giving away a lot of hints. <laughs> I'm just asking. I think I got them both. There you go. <laughs> Not that tough. 4 2, Arizona has the lead after San Francisco struck early and had the crowd really into it. 2 0, San Francisco. But Arizona scored three in their third and then the home run solo shot by Alex Cabrera here in the fourth. Hot foul. Well Danny Clausen gets a chance tonight because of reader on the mound Womack sits down Steve Finley sits down. And these are important games for guys like Danny Clawson to prove to Buck Walt and the organization that, hey, I belong here. I should be here next year. I can play for you. OK, 
question, I guess, is just, will Buck Showalter be here next year? I mean, the rumor bills are happening, obviously, and you know, Buck's taking a lot of heat. I, I feel for you, Buck, because I've been through it before. In, in the second half after the Schilling trade, about a month and a half ago, the rumors were starting out about Buck. Well, you know, maybe he's too control oriented. Maybe he's got too many rules. You know what? Did he get dumb in one year? All of a sudden, you know, they win last year, they win 100 games, and all of a sudden he got real dumb this year, I guess. So I, I, I feel for any major league manager that has to go through that because I've been through it. But you told the, the real story 200 fewer runs this yeah. year than last. And really, two players, That's Matt it. Williams, fouls a ball off of his foot. And then, after when he comes back, he gets plantar fasciitis. He has not been healthy this year. And that was no. such a dominant guy in the middle of their lineup. And for people that, that don't understand hitting, and for people that do, you've got to have your legs to hit. You've got to have your feet. Yes, you've got to have quick, quick wrists, strong wrists, great hands. But the leverage of the lower half of your body creates the bat speed. And if you don't have that, you try hitting back at home with standing on one leg or going to the beach and seeing how well you hit in sand. It's not that easy. You become an upper half hitter because of that if you don't have strong feet. And Mo Vaughn will attest to that. You know Mo Vaughn well. It's the same thing. Mo said I was never healthy last year after I sprained my ankle so badly and I couldn't plant the back leg. But for Matt Williams, he can't plant the front leg. Strike on the inside corner and Reader gets back to back strikeouts of Damian Miller and Danny Clawson. Ellis Burks, we will see when we come back. Burks winning the Willie McCovey Award earlier tonight. Our 7 Eleven baseball trivia question we asked who are the only two players in the majors to hit 20 plus home runs in every season during the 1990s? Drum roll, please. Kevin Kennedy, your answer. Barry Bonds and Matt Williams. And yes, they were teammates. Every year in the 1990s, they went 20 or more. Bonds healthy this year and hit a career best 48. Williams was not healthy and really a career low for Matt Williams with only seven home runs and 29 RBIs. Well, Mays has the most in Giants history. Bonds has 317, even though he started his big league career with the Pittsburgh Pirates. Well, Willie Mays has a statue. Do you think? Barry Bonds will have a statue. I think he will. I think he will someday. This guy is on the verge of cracking 500 home runs. I don't know that he'll quite get there this year, but he certainly will early April next year. Here's the Willie Mays statue with that swing, letting go and watching that ball fly out of Old Candlestick Park. And his restaurant is just a little to the right of that. <laughs> 24. Good deal, chop. <laughs> You're trying to get some free food every game, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, it's expensive. I will say that. <laughs> J.T. Snow walked his first time. Count is one and one with Todd Stottlemyre. That is outside two and one. Diamondbacks love to postpone the San Francisco party because it was the Diamondbacks who clinched here last year over San Francisco in an 11 3 win and the Giants have not forgotten that ball hit well towards left field twisting twisting and it is a foul ball almost like Cabrera going to right field an inning ago this ball just missed getting out of the ballpark for JT. Dusty Baker. Very popular with the players, the fans, the media. An honest gentleman. He had a nice talk with Dusty before the game, about 20 minutes in his in his office. I can't share it all, but I had a nice talk with him. <laughs> You know, he did talk about his players, uh, you know, how much he cares about the ball club, and pretty much said, well, that's apparent. You know, he, he's a man that has a lot of passion for the game. JT Snow ripping it foul to stay three and two. You know, there are born leaders, and I think he is one of them. Well, like I said, he's just got a lot of passion for the game. It sit at the top of the ball game, and now well, we got a problem out here with maybe Stottlemyre. 
Well, Stottlemyre is such an incredible story and so many injuries he's suffered in his past. And now it looks like he is holding the back of his right yeah, leg. Sure does. I mean, you might remember last year he was off to a four and one start as the Diamondbacks and appeared to be cruising to his fifth win on May 17th last year. And he was leading the Giants six to one when he was taken out of the game in the fifth inning and he suffered a rotator cuff injury and you know what that's like that is career threatening they never did surgery no and all they did was a lot of weights upper body that's right incredible workout with the trainers Paul Lassard and Dave Edwards but it's really the toughness of Todd Stottlemyre that has even gotten him back to this point well something's bothered him in the back of that right leg let's see the push off the right leg like a normal pitch right there just pushing off the right leg looked like he pulled the back of his the muscle in the back of his leg he's been on the disabled list twice this year once because of the shoulder but also because of the elbow he was out from June 25th to September 3rd because of a right elbow problem and Kevin when the season is over he will be uh, worked on and they will yep. surgically move a nerve when the season is over in his right elbow. How do you pitch with that kind of pain? Well, again, it's just like hitting. I just talked about Matt Williams a moment ago. If you don't have your legs, it's tough to hit. If you don't have your legs, it's tough to pitch. And if you've got leg problems, that's usually what goes first for a pitcher. That's why you run so much, you work out so hard, and you have to keep the endurance throughout the course of a long major league season. Your legs have to be strong. When a pitcher gets tired, a lot of times its legs get tired. Then you start standing up. Consequently, your pitches will be up. You lose your release point. And well, Stottlemyre especially, had to talk Buck. Yeah, talked him out of it. <laughs> he said, "I'm going to stay." And here's what he has to do. He has to do it on a three-two count. He has to throw a strike when he has been in pain, and all of a sudden has been slowed down a good two minutes. So now J.T. Snow. Either will say, okay, I'm picking on a fastball because I yeah. know that's what you're bringing. Now, that right leg, that's your drive leg, especially for a power pitcher. Not that Stottlemyre is a, a total power pitcher, but he does throw 91, 92. But that's your drive leg, and that's tough to push off on there. But 3 2 is fouled out of play. Well, he came with a strike, and Snow could only foul it away. But I've seen last year Roger Clemens had problems. It was his landing leg. And you know when you have problems with your legs Roger would never make an excuse but I know he, his mechanics were different last year velocity was down a little bit at times still got through it and they won the World Series but you see how Clemens is pitching now with the Yankees when he's totally healthy he's back to being the dominant guy that, that he's always been. So it's the same thing for a, for a Todd Stottlemyre you've got to have your legs to have a consistent release release point. Air ball popped up. Foul territory and out of play. Snow battling Todd Stottlemyre. And Todd is not one of those stand tall pitchers. He drops and he drives and he bends his leg and he, I mean, he needs a strong backside. Well, when I hear that you stand tall and fall, that, that, that term bothers me because what that, when you're telling a guy that, what it means is you start leading with the shoulder as opposed to leading with your hips. Your hips have to go first, then the upper half will follow. Liner. Just past the first baseman who catches it on the bounce. It will stay three and two. So since he felt a pull in the back of his drive leg, Stottlemyre has thrown three strikes, but Snow has fouled them all off. Now JT goes back and grabs some pine tar. Dig in again. Take a look now. Watch the left hip here, right there, right there. Leading with the hip first. That that has to go first before the upper half. Snow takes low, and there's ball four. The Giants will bring the tying run of the plate in Ellis Burks. Let's try this again right here. Watch the hip right here. Right there. Okay. That has to go first before the shoulder does. That has to lead first. Right? Now keep going. There it is. Right there. Right there. Freeze it. See? He's leading with the hip. That's good. This keeps the shoulder in, everything back. And then the upper half comes. So those are good mechanics right there for Stottlemyre. Leading with the hip. And I, I use that term because that's something that Sandy Koufax talks so much about. That was a difference. 
in his career when he had those six great years he understood about the leverage of your legs the lower half the leading with the hip creates the arm speed and the great arm angle that he had and he was a guy who pitched particularly later in his career with tremendous pain in his elbow and that is what Todd Smott Stottlemyre has had to go through this year and if Sandy had figured that out earlier he probably wouldn't have had that pain in the elbow. I wonder how many more years he could have pitched had he had Tommy John surgery early in his uh, career like so many you know, pitchers now. It's preventative. It's not that you know if you have perfect mechanics you're never going to get hurt. It's just that you have a better chance for longevity and to go out there every five days. And you look at guys like Nolan Ryan. Yes he had a God gift but he he also had great mechanics. And when Nolan got done at the end it was his legs really that bothered him the last couple of years more than anything else. Three and oh to Ellis Burks. Burke said he has not forgotten the Diamondbacks clinching at Candlestick Park last year. Burks was saying the way Candlestick Park was built, they had to come down the hallway and you could hear all of that celebration. And Ellis says, you better believe we are looking forward to clinching and in front of Arizona. Strike three and one. Just getting back one final point on, on what leading with the hips versus leading with the shoulder. If you stand tall and fall and you lead with the shoulder first, then you're all upper body. Then you all are just arm. You lose completely the power of your legs, and you have a better chance to get hurt by doing that. Ellis Burks with a drive to center field. This game is tied. Stay with him too long. Was he talked into it by Todd Stottlemyre? Well, it looks like it. Obviously, after walking J.T. Snow, then to get behind Ellis Burke, Burke's three and zero. Even though he was leading with the hips, he wasn't able to drive off the back leg. He's lost a few miles on his fastball, 87, 88. And if you're hurt with the legs, like I said, you're just not going to have great command. Burks came out for a curtain call and they are just waving thousands of white towels around here at Pac Bell Park. Burks with his 24th home run of the season. And it ties the game at four. Now a breaking ball thrown to Rich Aurelia. That is strike one as Alex has been the man for just about so many big moments this year for San Francisco. Yeah that's just a fastball right down the middle three and one count. Burke starts. San Francisco's record is 68 and 34. They say he inspires his teammates just because he is playing with so much pain in those knees, those damaged knees. He's also a wonderful guy and a tremendous team leader. He's one of those guys who's first to a guy's locker room when he's had a bad game and there to pick him up. Greg Swindell is starting to warm up in the Arizona bullpen. Aurelia checks the swing, rolls it to second base, and a very quick play by Jay Bell gets Aurelia. And a nice play by Jay Bell on a drop down breaking ball by Stottlemyre. A little check swing by Rich Aurelia. Not an easy play. Jay Bell stays with it. And Makes the nice feed of Colburn getting back to first base. Matt Williams talked with Todd Stottlemyre. This week, start your college football Saturday with the pregame show presented by Rivals.com at 1130 Eastern, 830 Pacific. Then at 330 Eastern, 1230 Pacific, it's triple header action starting with number six UCLA visiting Pac-10 rival Oregon, followed by Houston at number 15 Texas. Then Cal against Fresno State right here on Fox Sports Net. Now, I know you're a big, big football fan. Are the, the Bruins for real this year? I think they are, but I think they will <laughs> really be tested at Oregon. You got a, you got a prediction? 
I think Oregon's going to win. Do. I think UCLA is a marvelous football team. They have not been on the road yet this year, and Oregon, their fans are so close to the field in Eugene that they will be loud, making it impossible to hear any audibles. And Oregon has also won 16 home games in a row. Let's see where you're going. <laughs> Stoudemire throwing it by Doug Mirabelli. The count goes one and two. So that's one of the great matchups you can watch this weekend on Fox Sports Net. I'll be there with Tom Ramsey and Lisa Miloski. Our director tonight is Doug Freeman for our baseball Thursday game. He'll join us there. He is our director in college football Saturday. Stoudemire's count is even 2 2. He walked J.T. Snow. He gave up a two run home run then to Ellis Burks. It was a ground ball hit back. And look at the way Todd came off the mound. He did not burst off the mound. He caught himself. Yeah. And right away, Damian Miller waved him off, said, I've got this one right out in front of home plate, like a swinging bunt. And Miller made the play. The Giants just running away with the West 878 runs this year. That ties the San Francisco single season record set way back in 1962. And that was the year that the Giants, in their second year Candlestick Park, win the National League and go on to play the New York Yankees. And you know, that's also a season that gives the Arizona Diamondbacks some hope in the wild card race. San Francisco overcame a four game deficit with only seven games left to tie the Dodgers. I remember that's the year Maury Wills stole 104 bases was the National League most valuable player. Revolutionized the running game Maury Wills. No question. Oh Kirk Breeder came way out of the strike zone to try and swing that one. Tried to hit it into McCovey Cole. But it's Ellis Burks going to straightaway center field. And here it is to tie the game. Welcome back to Baseball Thursday on Fox Sports Net. Steve Fizio, Kevin Kennedy with you. Here's a beautiful look at Pac Bell Park. Here in San Francisco, really one of the most beautiful ballparks in Major League Baseball. It is. I, I think it's right up there in the top three, no doubt about it. And I think it's because of the, the, the bay and the scenery. And you know, it's only 15 minutes really from downtown. You can you can 15, walk to it. You're right here. Yeah, you can walk to it. Well, I mean, you know, Union Square. I mean the the good part. <laughs> <laughs> There's a base hit to right center field by Greg Colburn. He will stop at first base. Hey, I've walked back after a few of these games because you can't get a cab <laughs> before. No, it's 15 minutes from your hotel. <laughs> oh, well, that's that's right. <laughs> we all know you stay probably at the Fairmont. <laughs> four four ball game. Arizona. At one time had a four to two lead, but Ellis Burks with a two run home run in the bottom of the fourth tied it up. Cabrera with a solo home run. He showed a lot of power hitting it out to right field. Really in the teeth of a pretty fierce wind at that time. It's going crossing right towards left. And that's why Reeder wanted to keep him honest this time. Only an 84 mile hour fastball, but it was on the inside corner. Doesn't want Cabrera diving out over the plate just to keep him honest. That one stroke to left field. Bonds coming on, and he'll make the catch. Hey, we've got time for another Fox Sports Net Baseball Thursday game break as we check out the Cleveland Indians at the Boston Red Sox back at the Fenway Park game two of the twin bill top of the third Red Sox leading one nothing until Kenny Lofton hits this Tim Wakefield knuckleball for a double to left center which scores two runs drive blow it open by scoring six in the sixth inning and win this one eight to five Travis Fryman had four hits in the game so Cleveland splits that doubleheader wins three of the five. Chuck Finley picks up the win. He is now 14 and 11 for the tribe. 
Here's Matt Williams to left field base hit. They've been getting to Kurt Reader the last three innings he has given up now one two three four five hits the last two plus innings. And historically Kurt Reader is about a six inning pitcher and that's where we're at right now. Once Kurt gets to about that hundred pitch mark you start really watching him closely. Now Matt gets a pitch over the heart of the plate but watch it's every effort just to get down to first base again it's the left foot that he broke. And the several months ago and, and he's still feeling it. Giants all of a sudden getting their bullpen busy. And here is Damian Miller. But Tim Salmon went through the same injury two years ago and played the rest of the season in the American League. He could DH but he said it was incredibly painful to play right field. Well you said something that really hit me it's like Tim was actually explaining this to me one day I asked him about it and he said it's like tearing a, a piece of paper you said 10 percent tear if you could imagine people listening to this just tearing it a piece of paper and then tearing it in half and then going 50 percent and then all the way down that's that's what the thing was like and I can't even believe it. and he put up good numbers and fortunately yes, fortunately in the American League he could DH and that's what he did. The best thing still wound up with a 70 percent tear at the end of the season. That's right. It kept tearing and tearing and tearing. And the, the, the tough thing for Matt Williams is that he's got to play defense and especially when he makes a run like he just did to try to catch a foul pop up. I mean that could knock you out for a couple of innings. Three and one now Kirk Reader to Damian Miller. He's working with the bottom of the order. This is an area where Dusty Baker would like to see him settle around. There was an error. Actually, it was a mistake, an error on the second base umpire, Mike Winters. Down the left field line for Damian Miller. And here comes the go ahead run, Greg Colbrun. And they will also send Matt Williams. The throw to the plate is not in time. It is six to four, Arizona. I tell you what, Matt Williams is really gutty. I mean, he was hustling. On contact, he knew that ball was down the line, and he was thinking scoring all the way. A lot of guys would have just gone around second base and said, "You know what? I'll coast in the third. Matt was thinking scoring all the way. I was watching him the whole time up here, and he he ran hard from first all the way around third, all the way to home. Take a look at Matt Williams at first base. As soon as that ball's hit down the line, he's gone. Now that's down the line for a two-run double for Damian Miller. Just a shot no chance for Bill Miller tough tough play one step in a dive with a crossover but no chance but Matt Williams really digging in Bonds gets it in with a good relay just gets it back in but Matt's coming to score all the way a good slide throw just a hair late and you see him get up just a little bit slow it's that left foot. But you know what Steve as we said this is a big game for the Diamondbacks they win. They go back tied with the Dodgers. They'd be five games out. Both L.A. and the Arizona Diamondbacks would be five out from the wild card behind the New York Mets. And we will have a pitching change right away as Danny Clawson is getting ready to dig in the batter's box. And Dusty Baker wanted right-hander against right-hander. So Kirk Breeder leaves. Diamondbacks lead by two. <laughs> Six to four, the Diamondbacks over the San Francisco Giants. You just saw the Baja men singing Who Let the Dogs Out? And of course, they play that song in the San Francisco clubhouse after every victory. They are the junkyard dogs, they believe, here, the San Francisco Giants. Tough, mean team. Kelly Stinnett now comes in for Damian Miller, becomes the new catcher. After Miller doubling, broke that 4 4 tie. Pinch ran for him with Hanley Frias and Frias thrown out at third base. Well the Diamondbacks have lost five in a row and they haven't done that since June. So they're trying to stop that losing streak and try to get back somewhat in the wild card race. So I, Buck Showalter I, I think these last few innings is going to do everything he can to preserve this two run lead. They haven't had a lead in a while. And I think he'll mix and match and do everything he can to try to beat the Giants right here. He does not want them celebrating. In front of him. Well, they are new in town, and they'll be here for a while. Yeah, I think it's San inevitable. Francisco has an opportunity. It's going to happen. At least put it off a night if you can. 
four game series with Arizona here at Pac Bell. Dusty Baker wants to do it now. And there's a start, a walk to Jeff Kent. It was a walk that started it when they tied it up in the fourth on Alex Burks' two run home run. Burks will be up in this inning. Well, this week on Fox Saturday Baseball, the race for the playoffs continues as Juan Gonzalez and the Tigers visit Derek Jeter and the division leading Yankees, or Jason Giambi. And the A's take on Alex Rodriguez and the Mariners in a pivotal American League West showdown for first plus other regional action. Coverage begins with this week in baseball at 12:30 Eastern and Pacific. Check local listings for the game in your area. And J.T. Snow now gets hit in the back. So the Giants have two on down by two runs in the sixth. And Swindell normally has great control. He walks Jeff Kent first pitch of J.T. Snow up and in hits him. Kind runs are on and he's trying to go down and away. I mean he missed so badly that the fans thought it was intentional. But it was not he was trying to go down and away. You're not trying to do this in a two run ball game. Not when you haven't won in a week. Well, the guy at the plate tied the game up, and he had all the fans waving those white towels around here at Pac Bell Park in his last at bat. Ellen Burks, a two run home run tied it. A long ball, long ball here would give San Francisco the lead. 15 shy of 300. Ball one. Realize how good a player Ellis Burks is until you see numbers like that. Realize that he's hit that many home runs in his career. Remember when he came up, started with the Boston Red Sox. Mike Morgan has now jumped up, started warming up in the Arizona bullpen. There's a strike, one and one. Now that's a good changeup from Swindell. That's how he tries to get righties out. He'll mix in the fastball in off the plate, then go back with the changeup. But he's had trouble this year against right handed hitters. They're hitting close to 300 off of them. And it's one of the reasons Mike Morgan is up so quickly because you got three righties in a row here with Burks, Aurelia, and Doug Marabelli. Joe Walter stayed with the left hander because he had a right hander Kent and then the left hander J.T. Snow. Well he walks Kent and then he hits Snow. And all of a sudden Buck saying what do I have to do three right handers up. I've got my righty in the bullpen up. The count is two and one. Well what you have to do is get the, the righty up when the inning starts not after two guys get on because this is a guy you don't want beating you right here. And he got him up really too late. And so Swindell has to face Ellis Burks. And this was a shot, 415 to straightaway center field. That was a 3 1 fastball by Todd Stottlemyre. Two batters after he pulled a leg muscle in his right leg. And eventually had to come out of the ballgame after he finished that half inning. 2 2 the count. Nobody out. Bottom of the sixth. Burks back up the middle into center field base hit. Here comes Kent. He will score and San Francisco within one. Well, 91 runs driven in now for Ellis Burks. Watson not showing a whole lot of range. That looked like it could have been a double play ball when it was first hit off the bat, right off the end of the bat, but just got underneath the glove of Danny Clawson at shortstop. Take a look. A couple of steps and a dive. A lot of shortstops would have that ball and turn it into two. Instead, it turns into one run for San Francisco. Now the tying run in scoring position with nobody out here in the bottom of the sixth inning. Kent comes home with the fifth run. Well, here's a situation. Rich Jurelia leads National League shortstops in home runs. You've got nobody out. It's not an automatic bunt situation. And the reason I say it is because 
Rich is a good hitter, and you've got the eight and nine guys to follow. In the sixth inning, you might be better off just as Dusty's doing and letting him swing the bat and drive him in. Rather than bunt, if you bunt, then you're going to walk the eight hitter and then face the pitcher's spot. That's what Buck Showalter would do. So in this situation, it's not a bunt situation. Not with Richard really up there. Now, if he's your two hitter, it's a whole different story. You got Bonds and Kent coming behind you. Walk Bonds, you have to face Kent. That's right. Popped him up left side. Is there enough room for Matt Williams? He's drifting over, and it is just a foul ball. And the count will go Swindell's way, nothing in two. Now, if we're in the ninth inning and they're down one, Dusty probably would bunt. Let them go ahead and walk the eight hitter and then bring somebody off the bench to try to win the game. But in the sixth inning, it's early enough where they've got three more innings after this. They've got 12 outs to play with. Where and, and you have the best slugging shortstop in the right. National League this year. I mean, Aurelia first in home runs with 19, first in RBIs for shortstops with 76. That's right. And so those are the things you look at as a major league manager. Some fans will say, well, why don't you bunt? It's got to be automatic bunt. Not here. That's what a manager has to weigh out when he does bunt. Hit to right field, Alex Cabrera. That is always an adventure. Alex will make the catch, tagging at second, going to third. Is J.T. Snow, and now he's in scoring position with one out. He turns out to be a pretty good at bat for Rich Aurelia because he does get a pitch that he can go the other way on, and by going to right field with the fly ball, the runner from second can tag and go to third. If he hits that ball to left field, he can't get to third base, most likely. And not that with two strikes you have the option to play with to do that, but it just happened to work out that way. And now coming to the plate, Doug Mirabelli. One for two in the game, but only hitting 147 his last six weeks. And he is a double play threat. He does not run that well. And it's the time when you threw your two seam fastball, try to sink it on the outside corner and try to get the hitter to roll over. Ball one. Well, he went breaking ball there. Snow representing the tying run. He's at third. Go ahead run. Ellis Burks at first. His base hit brought them within one at 6 5. Upstairs, two balls and no strikes. Now Buck has not been happy with Mike Van Fleet behind the plate all night long. A little shake of the head showing his displeasure. I mean, that ball was <laughs> a ball that a lot of guys have hit out of the ballpark. Instead of being one and one, it's two and oh. He went around two and one. Yeah, he looking fastball 2 and 0 oh, had one pitch to play with and he got fooled on the curveball. But what happens from the dugout as a manager you can see height you can tell if it's low or high you you can't really see the corners because if your catcher sits off the outside corner and frames the ball well you can't tell if it's four or five inches outside from the bench but you can certainly tell height and that's what Buck Troll has been shaking his head on. Trying to keep Burks close at first base. In fact, the last pitch to Kent before he walked him, it looked like it was right at the knees, and it was called for ball four in this inning. That's when Buck starts shaking his head in the center. Upstairs, three and one. He's stolen five out of six. The count with Mirabelli, where Dusty may not put him in motion here. He may try to get the count to three and two because you don't want to run yourself out of an inning. And you don't want Mirabelli chasing a bad pitch. We'll see. He does not go, and the pitch is taken for a strike. Three and two. 
Well, here's that situation you were talking about where he may send them here on three yeah. two. Now three two it's a different story. I think Dusty will send him because you stay out of the double play. If Mirabelli hits the ball to shortstop and Burks is going and gets good enough jump. Now you've got a run driven in and a runner at second base and two out. So I'm taking the gamble here. I'm going to put him in motion. And that's what Buck's pointing out right there. Now what the catcher's doing right now, he's going out in front of home plate, giving the signs on a steal. There he is right there. He's giving the signs to the infielders. They're changing the signs. So he may not be throwing through on a steal here if Mirabelli strikes out, because they don't want Snow to steal home. So usually when a catcher goes out in this situation, three, two, two outs, he's changing the signs. It means he's not throwing through. We'll see. Birch does not go on the pitch swung on hit to right field Cabrera racing over it's a fair ball snow scores game time well maybe they're shouting now who let the Dugs out because Doug Mirabelli's blooper to right field locks up this game at six. And boy, when you're going well, the Jacks do a lot of things right, but when you're going well, this ball falls in fair inside the line by a foot rather than foul. When you're going bad, that ball lands foul by a foot. And Alex Ramirez does not, uh, Cabrera does not run extremely well, could not catch up to that ball. The ball had a lot of hang time. So you've got an offensive guy out there at right field which normally plays a lot of first base. You get him in there because you haven't been scoring runs, but yet it's cost you because he hasn't been able to get a, to a couple of balls today defensively. Swindell made two mistakes. He walked one, he hit the next bat. Right. Both have scored. That's exactly right. It goes right back to Greg Swindell. Setting up this inning for the Giants. And if you give him a chance, they're going to knock him in. Good hitting ball club. The Giants are second in the National League in team hitting. The team batting average at 282. So you, you can't put men on base against the San Francisco Giants. They find a way to drive them in. And the pinch hitter for the pitcher is Ramon Martinez. Two on. One out. Ball one. For 11 as a pinch hitter, but when he's played shortstop, he's he gets his hits and has a little bit of power. The Giants have a pretty good pinch bench. Not a lot of people know a lot of these guys, but they they have a good bench. Ramon Martinez is one of them. They've got. Armando Rios who can come off the bench and, and hit a home run play left or right field they've got Felipe Crespo switch hitter that has a lot of power they've got a, a bunch of guys on that bench that complement each other that not a lot of people know a lot about but when you break it down and evaluate it it's a good bench good balance oh, with a big swing misses two and one they've got Calvin Murray he was a PCL player the, the year of the league a year ago he can come out and Play some center field when there's a left tough lefty he can start in center. They've got some good guys that have come up to the system. Swing and a miss two and two and he was fooled in the last two pitches by Swindell yeah, up there. When a hitter's count, he's looking fastball. Swindell knows that being a veteran of 14 years, so he throws the curveball right here. And a good one. Breaking down and into the back foot of Ramon Martinez. And now he can come right back with that. The success he had just a pitch ago. Foul. And he stays two balls he and did. two strikes. Seems like Swindell has options with Ramon Martinez because he's been pitching him backwards. Everything that Martinez is looking for, he's throwing him something else. Now it surprised him with a fastball. That's exactly right. He's thrown a couple of curves. And we'll see what the call is. Runner at second base. 
You've got Stinnett going through a sequence of signs. He stayed with it and now he's on it so he's thrown three in a row. And when you see him foul it straight back. As a catcher you recognize that you say you know what now he's on that curveball. Now it's time to make a change change the eyesight. Would you come in or go away. With yeah I might go ball. up and in because he's been diving on the last three pitches unless Swindell has enough confidence to throw that good strikeout curveball that goes in the dirt because Ramon Martinez is an aggressive hitter. But the last two curveballs he was on those so you got to be careful. Comes in yeah. and Martinez pops it up. Good call. Inside with the fastball, Jay Bell will take care of it. Nothing doing. No advance, two out. That's that's good call right there. That's a little part of the game that young catchers out there, young pitchers, take note of. When you see a guy do that, three curveballs in a row, the last two, he's starting to get on. The last one he really got on, foul it straight back. That's when you change. That's how you call a ball game. There's no one pattern. You see Swindell working away, away, away. A sequence of curveballs, sinkers away. Now he comes up and in with the 87 fastball and because he changed the eyesight the 87 fastball ties you up and consequently you get on the label of the bat and you pop it up. That's just a good call right there by Stinnett and a good execution by Swindell. Now Marvin Bernard who knocked in a run back in the second inning. There's Bernard no has a couple on the base pass Kevin and Burks at second and Mirabelli first. There's no pattern to get back to calling a game. And people say, well, how do you call a game? 0 oh, and 2 you go in, 1 and 2 you throw a curve. No. It's a sequence of pitches depending on the situation of the game. The score dictates it where the runners are and also what the hitter's doing. That's why catchers have to watch hitters. Did yeah. you call that many pitches from the bench when you were a skipper at Texas and Boston? No, you know, in the minor leagues when I was managing in the Dodgers system, I, I wanted my catchers to learn how to do that. And if you're a manager that calls every pitch, how are they going to learn? And, and you were a catcher, so you wanted to yeah, call your own. I game. had guys like Darren Fletcher, Carlos Hernandez, Mike Piazza in instructional league. Those guys need to learn. That's the time to learn in the minor leagues. So by the time they got there, you don't need to call a game for them. And when I managed in Texas, I told my catchers, and I have young Pudge Rodriguez, I said, Pudge, I'll help you, but you don't have to look at me for every pitch. I might have called five, six pitches a game in certain situations like that very last one. Now, when I saw that, I wanted to make sure. He threw fastball in to get the, the pop up. Then I would call one. But in time, I, I didn't have to because Pudge learned. He said, "You know, I know now. I know what what you're talking about. Changing the eyesight. When to do that. When a hitter's on a fastball. When he's on a curveball." Nar just does get a piece of it. Town remains one and two. And you know, I've been watching a lot of the. Uh, we did the Dodger game last week. We talked about Chad Cruder working with Park. That's why that combination has worked so well. I think. Cruder really deserves a lot of credit for the way he's worked with Park. And, and I, I heard Sean Ho talking the other day on the radio after he won uh, his last start, and he said, you know, Chad was very positive after that start where, where I lost against Colorado by, by keeping me positive, thinking of the good games. And, and that's important, the, the catcher pitcher relationship. Bernard, sinking line drop, caught by Bell. That ends the inning, but San Francisco comes up with two clutch hits. By Burks, by Mirabelle, and here in San Francisco, who let the dogs out? That's the magic word clinch on one side, who let the dogs out on the other, as the San Francisco Giants just need a victory to clinch the National League West. Trying to get to the World Series for the first time since 1989 when they lost to the Cross Bay Oakland Athletics. And the Athletics competing tonight and leading Seattle 5 2 in the ninth inning. Those are their World Series seats. They are ready. Why not? And they're proud of their Giants here in San Francisco, nearing the 3 million mark. It's actually over. They've gone over it. We've had our statistician look it up. <laughs> it's actually over. They've never done that in San Francisco. Over three million, three one. There is J.T. Snow. He's come up with several clutch hits of late. He did not like that call from home plate umpire Mike Van Vliet. It is strike one to J.T. Snow drove in three of the four runs yesterday when they clinched at least a tie with a victory over the Cincinnati Reds. And then Ellis Burks, who has driven in three of their six runs tonight.
two and or one and one. New right fielder Jason Conte in replacing Alex Cabrera. Well, that's a good move because we've seen Cabrera make a couple of mistakes out there. Buck Showalter had him in there anyway for the lefty Kirk Reeder. And Cabrera had his three at bats, hit a home run, and they get him out of there. Snow to left field. This will be trouble. Into the corner it goes. The go ahead run is on at second base for San Francisco. Well, now you've got a dilemma because you've got Ellis Burks followed by Aurelia. And Ellis Burks is such a clutch hitter. You might want to think about putting him on right here and force Dusty Baker's hand to see if he's going to make a really a bunt or let him swing the bat. Situation that really had in his last at bat where he flew out to right center field. But it looks like Gus, uh, Buck Showalter is going to pitch to Burks. It's tough. You're, you're, you're pitching to a 350 hitter here. It's already homer to tie a game in the fourth and had an RBI single in the sixth. Burks with a little slow roller to the shortstop. Clawson, his throw is not in time. Infield hit, runners in the corners. Yeah, I mean, I'm really surprised that, that Buck didn't force the hand of Dusty Baker. Burks still runs well. He's just too clutch a hitter. I know that was just a little tapper, but even if he threw him out, he got the man over to third. Turns out he did not throw him out. And so now you got first and third, nobody out. Now there is no bunt situation. Now Aurelia, with 19 home runs and 76 RBIs, has a chance to drive in the go ahead run. Where if you walk Ellis Burks, you force Dusty Baker to make a decision. And he didn't do that. The result. Runners first and third, nobody out. Great opportunity for San Francisco to reclaim the lead, and then they may be getting up Rob Nen in the bullpen. As a matter of fact, it is Nen up now for San Francisco. There's Rob Nen. Mike Kruko, who is the Giants broadcaster, was making fun of Nen. He said, even if you have a seven run lead, I want you warming up because you <laughs> should be throwing the final out when you clinch the West. Yeah, you know what? He makes a good point. Eddie can have a couple of days off. Mike Morgan in a jam. Morgan gave up the double to J.T. Snow. Then the infield hit to Ellis Burks. I'm just a big believer you've got to make the other manager make a decision and, and put it on him and see what he's going to do. Now the decision is you've got to bring the infield in. Yeah, now Buck has to make all the decisions. He's got to bring the infield in, limit the range in the infield. you got a flat ball hitter in Aurelia. In the dirt, ball one. The wind blowing out to left. I mean, everything's in the Giants' favor here. I, I would have rather walked Bellis Burks to put it first and second to see if Dusty's going to bunt with Aurelia, which he probably would have. In the eighth inning, as opposed to the sixth inning in a tie game here. And if he doesn't, then you got a chance for a double play or a fly out or a pop out. Nobody at third base. So, how do you pitch Aurelia? He's a fly ball hitter. You've got to go for the strikeout. Now, you got the infield in. Mike Morgan has a great two seam fastball. He's a sinker ball pitcher, and that's what you got to go with. You got to go with the pitcher's strength here. And this is not an infield that has. Great range. We've seen that from the young shortstop Danny Clark oh. tonight. Jay Bell limited in his range at second base. Matt Williams, plantar fasciitis at third. That's right. And they've got the infield basically in. They fake to first, throw to third. JT, the veteran, doesn't buy it. He's back easily. Mike probably tried that in high school before he signed and went to the big leagues, and it worked. <laughs> Well, he About thought 23 years ago. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, thought, well, 60 years later, it might work again. <laughs> Snow third representing the go ahead. That's not going to work against this team. Really? Chops it to Williams. He will go to first base, advancing to second on the play as Ellis Burks. Snow has to hold a third. Yeah, one thing Morgan has, as I said, he's still a ground ball pitcher because of that good sinking action. You know, really, it tried to get underneath it to get it in the air, couldn't do it, and rolled over it. 
San Francisco will pull Doug Mirabelli back and they will go with a pinch hitter and it looks like it's going to be Russ Davis. Well you've got another fly ball guy but an also a guy that you can strike out. So we'll see it we'll see in this situation if Buck Showalter decides to load the bases and go for two. Now they've got a good bench so they've got Rios on the bench they've got Crespo they've got all kinds of guys. If Buck, if Buck Showalter does that. Armando Rios you see in the background with a bat in his hand he has come through in the clutch so yeah, many he's times a good this hitter. year. He's good off the bench. He's hit a lot of pitch hit home runs and that's exactly what Smith and Morgan are talking about. What do we do here. Well, the general manager said earlier this year he was so sick and tired of hearing about the poor Giants. He said hey they're a good team. One of the reasons they're a good team is because they have a strong bench. Fans want it tonight. Now, Mike Morgan, I mean, they've been looking in the dugout to see what Buck wants. And Buck's going to leave it up to Morgan being a veteran pitcher, what he feels more comfortable doing. Well, Dusty was yelling out at Mike Van Vliet, the home plate umpire, saying, Hey, would you go talk to him That's and right. start this game? Come on. Well, Morgan now warming up. He hurt himself. I mean, that's the only way you can get some extra and so warm up. Dusty wants an explanation from Van Fleet. I, I do too. Because Buck Showalter <laughs> never came out. No. This was a decision that was made either on their own or Buck just yelled it out. Bruce Fremming, who's the crew chief, comes over to visit. I see that. Colburn went in, I guess, to get another glove. That's what it looked like. Colburn went into the dugout. And they were waiting for him, and that's what it was. I just saw Greg come out of the dugout. And I don't know whether that was to buy time for the bullpen or just to get another glove. Either way, Russ Davis, who's been hitting, is now loose. He's loose, and they're going to pitch to Russ Davis for the reason that I thought, just because that bench is so strong. You got you got Rios ready to come up and hit. And of course. Buck's got the bullpen up and ready also. Davis, and first pitch swinging, fouls it out of play, strike one. And a couple of things. Davis is another guy that can knock the ball deep enough to get a run in or hit you out of the ballpark, but he also can strike out. So rather than load the bases, obviously Morgan and Buck Showalter are still better, but they have a better chance of keeping the game right here facing Russ Davis, even with the infield in. We'll see. To center field, this will be plenty deep enough. Making the catch, the center fielder. Here comes Snow, and he will score. And San Francisco is in front, seven to six. He went to the umpire first. 
because the pitcher spot is due to hit third in the top of the ninth inning. So Buck's making a double switch. And this is the Giants clubhouse. They've gotten the plastic on up to protect everybody's valuables, and they are ready to celebrate here in San Francisco a Western title. Dan Plesak will try and shut the door on the Giants when we come back. Barry Bonds says, break that tie, Russ Davis. You're watching Fox Sports on Star Select. A Russ Davis sacrifice fly breaks the 6 6 tie in the bottom of the eighth inning. And the Giants have a 7 6 lead on Arizona. Dan Plesak now comes on to face Felipe Crespo. Ball one. If the Giants can clinch the title this evening, it will mark the earliest time they've wrapped up the division or league championship since their last world championship season of 1954. They wrapped it up on September 20th of 54. Little check swing looper over the pitcher, Plesak's head. Tough play by Bell. Everybody's safe for run score. 8 6 San Francisco. By Mirabelli, now a blue pit by Crespo. Everything's going right for San Francisco. Uh, you've got that right. I mean, like you said earlier, when things are going well, you get these types of breaks. And everything has gone well this year for Dusty Baker. You take the two run lead at least going into the ninth with Rob Nem. Well, they're feeling it now. He felt it last year when the Arizona Diamondbacks clinched at San Francisco on September 24th. And Dusty Baker talks about a huge meeting they had when the team started 4 and 11. They went to Bank One Ballpark and they had just a meeting, not in the clubhouse. Just down at a restaurant where the guys broke out some cold ones, had some laughs, and they went out and they swept Arizona. And Dusty really feels that was one of the first turning points of this year. Everybody talks about July 1st, but he said back in April, we were stumbling along. Yeah, they were. And they sweep the National League West champions. Well, they, like we said before, they were 0-6 to start the season right here. 4 and 11 overall, but 0-6 in Pac Bell alone. And I've always believed this when you open a new ballpark, and I actually said this during the season, is that when you're opening a new ballpark, it plays to no one's advantage until you get used to playing it. And the Giants are used to playing it. I mean, they, they play the caroms in the outfield well. They've got the crowd excited. They've drawn over three million people, and they're locked in. Jeff Kent so responsible for San Francisco being in first place in the National League West. And so is that man Rob Mann who will be coming out to try and close it in the ninth inning. Barry Bonds very possibly the National League most valuable player another terrific September. Well, I think if they finish with the best record, and they've got a good chance of doing that, the way they're playing, and the, and the numbers Bonds has put up, and particularly the last six weeks where he's hit a lot of clutch home runs, I think Bonds is a leading candidate now. He's gone right past Mike Piazza. One ball and two strikes, police act against Marvin Bernard. Russ Davis broke the tie with a sacrifice fly to center field, scoring JT Snow from third base and the infield hit by Felipe Crespo, who's now at first base. Just swing and rolls it foul. It'll stay one and two. JT gave him the lead. Talking before this ball game with me about 
if we do clinch it now, what the responsibilities are each and every member of this team to go out and grind it out to the very end to get to the playoffs, there'll be no rest. Yeah, well, I said this earlier about September 20th in Boston when we clinched it. I experienced that and gave a few guys a rest here and there, but you know, to, to clinch with about 10 days to go is, is a good thing for rest to get your rotation in order. But it's also you've got to maintain that intensity and realize it's only the first step. I mean, you've got a couple more sets of playoffs before you get to the World Series. So you don't want to have such a great season, 162 games, and then get a lot losing the playoffs in a five game series. Bernard fouls it out of play. You're right because the team that, that you have to admire most for doing that was the New York Yankees when they won so many games, 114. They clinch it early in September. Right. Now they have to play the rest of the way. And really, I think that put in incredible pressure on Joe Torre. Yeah, it, well, it's a job of it's going to be the job of Dusty Baker and his staff, and he's got a lot of good professionals out there, veteran guys now, and this club has played to, together, like I said, for so many years that I'm sure they'll be up for it. But it's not easy because there's a little bit of a letdown of the first couple of days and you realize because you know the only thing they're playing for is the best record overall which is a good thing to play for. But you really have to maintain that intensity and, and say hey these games are just as important uh, to go into the playoffs with good momentum. Sparky Anderson once told me that the most difficult job of managing he ever had was in 1984. The club wins 35 of the first 40 games and Sparky said I didn't want to be thought of as the idiot who lost a huge lead That's like right. that. I remember him saying that. He told me that same very same thing. He wasn't. They went on and won <laughs> the world championship and it was his third in his Hall of Fame career. Well that's what you don't want when you've had the season the Giants have had is is just say you know hey we won the division and that's great. You know it's a, it's a five team division they win that and then go home after the first round then it's it's pretty much all for not. We've got too good a ball club and that's not the mindset you want. But it's still nice to to clinch the season early and to clinch the, the division this early. Rest your players keep that focus. Giants with an 8 6 lead in the bottom of the eighth. Very Menard nice. takes strike three. So Plesak gets the breaker over. But here comes Rob Nen for San Francisco to try and wrap it up and clinch the National League West. Stay with us. Baseball Thursday game break. We head upstairs to Seattle. Where the Oakland Athletics are battling the Seattle Mariners, and Jason Isringhausen gets Alex Rodriguez and a ground ball to end the game. So, right now, a 5 2 final. Oakland wins it, and the Mariners are only two games up on the Oakland Athletics. Meantime, the A's are locked up with Cleveland in the American League wildcard race. So, Art House team getting it done tonight. Three outs to go and Rob Nen. Giants getting it done right here. With three more outs. They clinch the National League West. Robbie Nen, 38 saves. Earned run average 1.33. This guy has been unbelievable. 86 strikeouts and 61 innings. He has converted 25 straight save opportunities. His last blown save was July 2nd against the Los Angeles Dodgers. 17 walks, 86 strikeouts in 61 innings. No runs allowed in the last 27 appearances. And the batter is Tony Womack, and he takes a strike. The executive producers of Fox Sports Net are Arthur Smith and Bill Borson. The coordinating producer for Baseball Thursday is Larry Myers. Tonight's game was produced by Jerry Weinstein and directed by Doug Freeman. Strike two, two and two. Head of field operations is Andrea Jenkins. G Money, Gary Nichols, Ken Breitstein, Jim Pels, Tom Carroll, Steve Klopp doing a great job in that truck. J.T. Snow broke the 6-6 tie. Scoring on that man, Rush Davis' a sacrifice fly. Barry Bonds wants to win it. Back to the playoffs. Womack swings, sends it to right field, and that will drop. 
Burks races it in. Womack turns and heads back to first base. But Rob Nen gives up a leadoff single to Tony Womack. You know, Ellis Burks with those sore knees is running better than I've seen him in a long time. I mean, he battled it, he, he beat out an infield hit to help the Giants go ahead in the bottom of the eighth inning, and he cuts this ball off. Tony Womack, this looked like a sure double in the right field corner. Take a look at Ellis Burks, though. Getting there quickly, one hop, full 360, throwing a strike back into the his second baseman there, Jeff Kemp. Keeps Tony Womack at first base, and the importance of that, it keeps double play in order. Bobby Estelea, the new catcher for San Francisco, after Doug Mirabelli was pinch hit for in the last inning. And the new hitter is Greg Council. And throws ball one. And one thing about Council is he works the count pretty well. A good strikeout to walk ratio. He really will take you deep into the count. So you're going to have to throw strikes to him in this situation. Runner goes, pitch taken for a strike, one and one. Well, now the double play is not in order. JT Snow was holding him on, but now what they gain by the stolen base from Womack, what the Giants gain is that they have JT Snow playing back and there's no hole on that right side. So they'll take an out right here defensively instead of a run. If you're holding him on and the ball's hit through there, you got first and third. And then comes inside, two and one. Bob just 30 years old just signed a new four year contract prior to September 1st game against the Chicago Cubs that will keep him in a Giants uniform at least through 2002. Three and one. Well that's the same pitch that Mike Van Fleet did not call for the Diamondbacks earlier in the ball game when Buck Showalter was getting upset. That was a pretty good pitch but. At least he stayed consistent for both sides. And now what Council has to do, because he's not a power hitter, take a strike here. And there is a strike three and two. Man does not want to put that tying run on the base pass. Not when you're getting ready to turn that lineup over with the power hitters. Now they still have Steve Finley on that bench too for the Diamondbacks. And Buck would like to bring Finley up. Only if they can win the game, put them ahead. Council swings, ground ball second, Kent has it. One out going to third in the play, Tony Wilman. Well, that's the importance of the stolen base right there because that might have been a double play ball otherwise if Womack had not stolen it. Rob Nen now must face David DeLucci. Womack single. Council is grounded out. Two outs away from the Giants clinching the West. Strike one. Last year was the Diamondbacks clinching at San Francisco at that time Candlestick Park. And the Giants were saying they remember because the clubhouse is right across the hallway. They could hear the celebration. Strike two. Did they want payback? Yes. Diamondbacks last year winning 100 games. The Giants only 86. They finished 14 games behind Arizona. Think about this Giants team. There's not anybody that I know that picked the Giants to win this division this year. Nope. I think a lot of people picked the Dodgers. A lot of people picked the Diamondbacks. I don't know anybody that picked the Giants. Ground ball foul. And when they got Kurt Schilling, I thought, wow, what a one two that's going to be. Johnson and Schilling. And San Francisco just kept the pedal to the metal and they just kept on grinding out victory after victory. Last time we were here, they had won nine in a row. Yeah, that's what Buck Showalter thought too when he had that combination of Johnson and Schilling. But that's exactly what they needed. Jerry Colangelo said, hey, I was at the Hall of Fame game back in July. I knew the club was down. They were in first place, but they were down for some reason. I thought the Schilling 
upgrade would make the difference. He strikes him out, and the Giants run out away from clinching. Now, just not a very good at bat by DeLucci. Swinging badly at bad pitches, bad sliders. But that's a tough part about Robbie Nett. He throws his fastball anywhere from 93 to 97. And what he did on DeLucci, he threw him sliders. So DeLucci was way out in front, and his sliders 88 miles an hour with great movement. Everybody on their feet at Pac Bell. Then against Danny Batista, ball one. Batista has hit the ball the hardest of all the Diamondbacks tonight, lining out in the first, tripling in a run in the third, singling sharply in the fifth, flying out deep center field in the seventh. To right field, could this be it? Burks at the wall, leaps, it's off the wall. A run will score, it's an 8-7 ball game. Tell you what, the wind is blowing toward left field, but that ball carried. Yeah, that looked like a routine fly ball off the bat. I know Danny Batista is strong. I think Burks thought he had a shot too, and he did. He, he did everything he could to get to this ball. He played it well. But that ball had some carry to it. And a great job by Marvin Bernard backing up and keeping Batista at second base. Yeah, high fastball, middle in. Batista just gets it up in the air. Nen supplied the power. And Burks gets back there just about as well as he could. And the ball actually did hit a little bit lower than I thought, but that ball just took off. Tying run at second base and a tough batter at the plate in Jay Bell. Bell's numbers down this year, but last year 38 home runs, 112 driven in. And Estaleo wants to talk with Rob Nen. That's the first run he has allowed in more than two months. You want your fastball to be that much quicker. I see that's a pretty good stretch. <laughs> but you do, you've got to believe the pressure's on. He knows the fans are on their feet. They're ready to celebrate. Yeah, I thought that when he threw the first two pitches for balls, I thought he might get wild tonight and get a little over anxious. Then he came back and and threw strikes. Even though Womack got on there, it was a big ground ball out that he got. A great counsel on three two pitch. That was a huge out. Bell pops it foul. Count goes to one and one. And if you're thinking home runs off of Robbie Nen, this is his 64th game. He's only given up four. For right handed hitters, he's only given up one. Right handed hitters are only hitting 117 off Rob Nen this year. Upstairs, two and one. 40,900 here at Pac Bell Park had a better view than home plate umpire Mike Van Fleet <laughs> as they go. Oh, Jay looking for his first hit off Rob Nen in his career. Well, to center field and deep. Marvin Bernard, is this, this it? The catch is made. The Giants punch the National League West. It's time to party, San Francisco.